Have you enjoyed the chocolates? Very powerful. I know people out there saying, what is that now? Yes. How can you say it like that? So the book of Luke 17.32 is our lead scripture. It says, remember Lot's wife. We know that there are other shorter, shorter scriptures like Jesus wept. Other, other versions say, and Jesus wept. So it puts it in the same level as this one, as the shortest in the Bible. So this is one of those short scriptures, but what is coming out of it is quite astounding, very profound. The profundity of what is coming out of there is astounding, right? Because you see that the Lord essentially spoke into the life of the present day church. When he said, remember Lord's wife, he spoke so much. It was such a caution, precaution, and warning to the present day Christian, the body of Christ, the Christian believers, and the way they are going on the wide road. And today we live in a liberal time where there is a lot of liberalism. It's a very, very liberal time where there is a lot of liberalism in terms of uh, what you can do, feminism, which rights, human rights, and uh, also you have uh, uh, a lot of rights, democratic rights, space, and all that, what have you, right? And the present day church has attempted to infiltrate that into the Christian worship experience. And what that has done is essentially to dilute the original basic Christian salvation of the cross and the blood that Jesus unleashed released, bathed out, inaugurated at the Calvary cross, right? So it has diluted it and made it more fancy with greater expediency, with greater latitude of space to accommodate convenience, to accommodate different interest groups. But that is not the Christian salvation that the Holy Spirit unleashed out at Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit strictly based it on the cross and the blood. It is a salvation that has no negotiation. It is a salvation that needs not to be sorted out. You don't need to give in and give out and balance, give and take. Not at all. When Jesus came and died for the church, it was an exacting law of God. God's exacting law was instituted. Why? Because nobody else, they searched in heaven, they searched above heaven, they searched on the earth, they searched under the earth, they searched in the oceans. Nobody else was worthy to take the scroll. Nobody was worthy to take the scroll and unleash out God's redemption plan for mankind. And that's why when the Lord now brought Jesus that was an exacting law. There is no latitude of kind of navigation or safety valve or anything or some space for discussion. It's an exacting law. Only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Are we together? And so that's why it's very important that this generation will be able to find their way back to the original basics of salvation, the basics. And we live in a modern Taiwan now very modern Taiwan, producing a lot of computer parts, computer chips and everything. Uh, a very modern world whereby now mankind has tried to bring, infusing their modernism into the church, into salvation. And the, the tragedy is that the pastors have accepted it. And they have tried to negotiate the gospel to be able to accommodate many interests in the church. And that is the tragedy of hell that is looming upon the present day Christians, right? But now we thank God the Lord has sent us to be able to navigate the church back to the original cross and the blood of Jesus. Uncompromising gospel of holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. Are we together? Now, we saw very clearly that when the Lord said, remember Lord's wife, the, 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 the seamless Induction, their adoption, they are adopting or adapting it 
to the present day church, we went to Hebrews chapter 6, 4 to 6, where we saw that, yes, it is true, God is justified to warn this generation of the body of Christ. Why? Because they have looked back. And the, 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 the attendant warning is Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, Hebrews 10, 26, 31, and 2 Peter chapter 2, 19 to 22. Those are scriptures warning on the abuse of the grace. That you receive the grace and then you try to muda or mutilate it or modify it to accommodate your modernism or your personal interests or to accommodate your wickedness which you are not able to shed in totality. That is what has happened in this age. And that's why when you look at, for example, the way the pastors are preaching today, they are preaching money, money, money. You can tell very clearly that they have looked back. Why? Because you can tell clearly that in their preaching or demeanor or behavior, they are actually, you can tell a debate. There, there is a negotiation or a debate with the Lord. They are trying to get another standard. And we saw that all of the above lessons are well exuded in the message the Lord puts forward when he says, remember Lord's wife. Because Lord's wife, we have encountered moments when that family was hesitant. They were being told by the very messengers, glorious, who are going to damage that city, who are going to destroy it. The angels of judgment themselves, the ones that weld the power, the messengers who have come with the wrath of God, were saying, please, we are going to destroy this thing. Turn away from sin. Run out of here. And we saw the hesitation. In Swahili, they call it kusita sita. And today you see it in the present day church also. Leave alone the generation. The generation also. Because the prophecies I've given have touched on all and sundry. They have touched the born again and the non-born again. When I gave the prophets of Haiti earthquake, struck everybody. The Nepal earthquake struck everybody. Chile earthquake, it did not say, no, we are only dealing with the church. Not at all. Mexico earthquake, the neutron stars, everything shook the whole world. And so therefore, what we are seeing here is very pivotal, very critical. Because the generation has not rushed to repent. That is the symbolism, the characteristic of the hesitancy. To be hesitant, they had hesitation. They hesitated. And the present day Christian also has hesitated. And we know hesitation is one way of defining backsliding. It's another word for backsliding. Hesitation. Look at this now. Now, he's saying that the Egyptian pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is an atheist. In fact, he's a pagan. Put it well. If you want to really catalog him well, he's a pagan king that is worshipping created things, material, physical things, mountains, what, pyramids, and what have you. Now, that pagan king, when the prophecy of the Lord came to him, when Joseph came to him and told him that the Lord says there is going to be seven years of bumper harvest and seven years of total drought. The same vision the Lord showed me. It's amazing that somebody is walking in this age that is repeating Bible. Do you remember when he showed me the seven cattle that the fat ones eating by the river? By, by, the, by the river? In fact, I understand better because the reeds, the reeds are, their roots are in the water and they are going under the water above, a little bit above, but inside the water and then in front they now rise up with their leaves. So the cattle are stepping on those, the part of the stems are under the water and they are fat and sleek. But when the Egyptian king when he got the prophecy of God that bumper harvest is coming, famine is coming, then the king that is pagan, he believed the prophecy of God. And the evidence that he believed the prophecy of God is that his conduct, his behavior changed. Otherwise, if your behavior does not change, it, it, is, it is a characteristic of hesitation. You have hesitated to obey. You have not obeyed. Hesitant to obey. So, a pagan king did not hesitate when the prophecy came that that place is going to be destroyed by what? Famine. Seven years of bumper harvest, seven years of total drought. 
And the evidence that he did not hesitate is that he, be, he appointed Joseph. The appointment of the office of Joseph as prime minister was in fact the solid evidence that the king of Egypt, a pagan king, obeyed and believed the prophecy of Yahweh. And when he believed, he appointed Joseph. Another feature that really proves that he believed, the pagan king is believing the prophecy of God, he built big silos, big storage, big storage all across the country, and he gave an ordinance, a law, that everybody must grow a lot of crop in all their field, and they must be able to store, to store up 5%. Eugene, tell that young man that here we don't type the message on computers. For me, I believe in people who write, not fooling around with typing. They write in their books and take home. These computers are the Lord's. And so, very serious. The evidence that the pagan king believed is the change of conduct. Now, when you look at the present day church, the cloud has come. The announcement that the tribulation is coming has been made globally. And right now, my daughter who has come, this very senior leader from Taiwan, a congress lady and so forth, a very senior in that country, she has said, when I go there, they want to host me on her TV program, which she hosts, which reaches 100 million people at one go. Now, you can imagine... That the world has already heard, even from this broadcast we have here, that the Messiah is coming. That destruction is coming. Because even my prophecy has been fulfilled on their screens in Israel. So the whole world has heard. But there is hesitancy to obey. Not everybody has repented. Why is there no revival flames? Why is it that now the whole world, all nations are not in revival, repenting? Why? Because they have hesitated. They have done exactly what Lot's wife did. And the sad part of that is even the church has hesitated. The cloud of God has come. You can see all over the wall here, those pictures. The cloud of God, that is Yahweh himself. The God they worship. But they have not run. They have not run and said, no, I know this God. This is Jehovah Yahweh. What is he saying? I want to submit. They have hesitated. They are still feeding other people's businesses. Churches called businesses. They, those pastors are saying, putting bad words so they can continue eating from them. So there is hesitation and hesitancy. That has come out very clean and clear. Are we together? That the generation has hesitated to obey and to execute. So we have seen now the import of, remember Lord's wife. Lord's wife, the looking back. We have seen the importation of that into this age by reading Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, Hebrews 10, 26, 31, and 2 Peter chapter 2, 19, 22, right? Now, I want to advance the conversation and enter the body of this conversation. I'm picking particular scriptures here as we move on. Zephaniah chapter 1, 10 and 12. If you can read with me the book of Zephaniah chapter 1, that we may now understand what is the message to the church. Zephaniah chapter 1, blessed people. I'm reading verses 10 and 12. Where it says, on that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter, and a loud, again, are we together? Reading together, right? And a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you who live in the market district, all your merchants will be wiped out, and all who tread silver be destroyed. And then he says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on his dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Hallelujah. 
So what is the Lord saying here in this tremendous scripture where he is raising a flag, a red flag, a warning, remember Lord's wife. He's saying that this generation also is like Lord's wife. They have looked back. Why? Because they don't believe. They have disobeyed the command of God. Why? Because they don't believe that a day will arrive when God will judge the world. Everybody now focus on me. If you look at this entire scripture of Luke chapter 17, 32, remember Lord's wife, a short scripture, three words. Remember Lord's wife. What do you see there? You see that, look, that Lord's wife was delivered out, was delivered by the angels out. And you see another thing, that when she reached out and it was time to go, Lot was leading them, right? And Lot expected that every member of his family had heard and listened and obeyed the instruction of the Lord that flee and don't look back. So there was no time for Lot to even check if his daughter, any daughter or member of his family or wife has looked back. They simply went forward. You cannot. You expect that everybody has personal responsibility. In other words, the salvation of the grace of God. Once you receive it, only the Lord can save you based on your personal voluntary obedience. You cannot say I will depend on the voluntary obedience of his wife or his hu her husband or whatever. So look at this now. As they were walking, they are walking, they are going. The husband, Lot, did not have time to check whether she was following. Because if he checked, it would have constituted what? Looking back. And he don't want to do that. He, he don't want to do it. He don't, he don't want to do it. He does not want to try that thing. He cannot even check whether his last born daughter, his sweetheart, the last born daughter, has come along. There is no privilege, there is no opportunity because the command has been given. And everybody has heard it so well, it's an exacting law that you can eat all the fruit from all the trees in this garden. But you cannot touch this particular tree and its fruits. That on the day thou toucheth that fruit, thou will certainly die. Everybody heard it so clear that God has his exacting law that is non-negotiable. And we know too well that God is not in the business of joking. He's very serious on redemption. So look at this now, everybody. So, Lord is walking. His family is following by. He must be leading them. And as Lord is going, the wife looks back and instantly pia, struck. The judgment of God comes at the moment you least expect. So her looking back describes the following. Number one, disobedience. Number two, dishonoring God. Number three, not believing God. Number four, apostasy. And so there's so much I'm going to share on this. They're looking back. But most importantly, what I want to handle is this. As of priority. The Lord is simply saying, look, when you look at the book of Luke chapter 17, that the Lord is using to launch Lord's wife. Her name is not given in the Bible. After everything has happened in the book of Genesis, the Bible never talks of her again until Jesus now comes to talk about her in the New Testament. So look at this. If you look at that scripture domain, that she's mentioned in, it says the coming kingdom of God. That is the subtitle there. But when you go down, you hear him describing a day, that there is a day coming. The day of the judgment of God is coming. That is what that scripture is all about. That there is a day of judgment coming to the earth. And the Lord is saying, 
those that shall not obey the instruction of God, they will be swept by the inescapable judgment of God. And God Almighty is highlighting that there is a day coming when God will judge the world. Because Lot's wife, by looking back, she was judged. And that's why I began by reading Zephaniah, whereby now you can tell in her mind she did not believe that God was going to judge. Otherwise, she would not have looked back. Are we now together? And she sounds more like a church I know in this age that is also complacent and behaving as though she is not believing every time I announce that the judgment of God is coming. The coronavirus was simply a little window to give you a glimpse into the wrath that is coming. Their bearable judgment coming. But they are behaving as though they don't believe the judgment of God is coming. Hallelujah. This is serious. Very serious. The judgment of God is coming. Very, very clearly here. God is highlighting that there is a day of the judgment of God coming. And that those that don't comply, don't obey the instruction, the command of God. Those that express free will, say I have my personal will. God has sent his servants to warn us that the Messiah is coming. We need to repent. He has seen the Messiah coming and he knows the type of church to be taken. He has called the cloud of God to give evidence or proof that indeed God has sent him with that message and he has opened heaven. He has raised our cripples, opened blind eyes, opened deaf ears, loosened mute tongues, cleansed leprosy, resurrected dead body, done things as proof. As proof. They all point at one thing. As proof. That yes indeed it is true. There is a day coming. When God will judge sin. But you can see very clearly. That Lot's wife did not believe. That God judges sin. Or that God. Because he didn't judge for a long time. And so most likely. She didn't even think he will judge. And that's why I read Zephaniah. About the complacency. That was happening in Jerusalem. When they said God may never do good or bad, he may never do anything. He has not done it in a long time. He has not done it in a long time. So he, may, he, he will not do it. So this generation too, if you go into the streets and ask them, do you just do a random interview. Do you believe that God judges sin? They might even tell you no. For me, I don't believe he judges sin. I pay my taxes. I am not a criminal. Why would God just turn around and punish me for no apparent reason? I give money to, to the Red Cross. They will give you all manner of reasons why they think God cannot judge them. So they don't even believe that God judges sin. But the Lord is saying that a day will come when he says, remember Lord's wife. He's essentially saying, a day will come when those that fail to enter heaven, fail to, those that will not have obeyed and submitted and taken holiness as a lifestyle, when they will finally be judged and it will be swift and sudden and it will be unreversible, unreversible. In other words, everybody focusing on me still as we begin this, he's saying the Lord is using Remember Lord's wife, somebody that did not enter, is using that scripture, that example of Lord's wife to raise forth the dangers of obstacles in your life that can cause you not to enter heaven. The things in your life that can cause you to look back, to start looking back at the world, your sinful life, that you heard before. This is serious warning from the Lord. That there is a danger. Of certain things in your life. Choking. Choking. Kunyonga. To strangle. Choke your eternity. 
For Lot's wife, it was the life in Sodom. Maybe it was even the sons-in-law of her, the, 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 the husbands-to-be of her daughters together with her big house that she said, wow, wow am I, how come I'm losing all this? And caused her to look back. And the Lord is saying that even you need to examine yourselves and check out what is it in your life as a Christian that you think is choking, is strangling you are eternity in the kingdom of God. That is pulling you back to cause you to look at the world, the sinful world, where you were before. And so that is the journey I want to walk through. I'm sure right away, look at this now. I'm sure right away, if you are like me, the things that are flagging and flashing in your mind at this time should be when the Lord has prepared a banquet, sent people to invite those prepared, invited for the banquet, and they say, no, I bought an oxen. No, I've married a young wife. No, I've married a field. What is it in your life that is causing you not to enter glory? Pulling you back to focus on the world. We all know Matthew 22. So that, those are some of the things that should, if you are really a Christian, and the bishops that you are here. Those are the things that must be flashing on your head right now. Say, wow, now I understand well what the Lord is saying. He's even telling us about Matthew 22. When he prepared a banquet, he wanted people to enter heaven. But there are certain things that stopped them from entering heaven. He has just married a new wife, a young wife. He has just bought some oxen. He has just done what? Bought a new field. There are things that will cause you not to move into the kingdom of God, but stop and look back. They will pull you back to the world. And the devil uses them to the max. Hallelujah. Are we now beginning to talk seriously? The Lord is saying, examine thyself. thyself. Examine yourself and ask yourself, what is it in my life that is pulling me back? That is causing me to look back? Because in Matthew 22, even before we read, the banquet is prepared inside the kingdom of heaven. God the Father sends them, go and tell those for whom it has been prepared. They are the bona fide people. For whom is prepared. God tells them the fattened cattle have been slaughtered. The drinks are sweet. The tables have been reserved with names. Everything is ready. Tell them to come. But they said, nope. I've just married a young wife. I cannot come. You, now you can see some of the things that can block you. I have, because the Bible says, some will be marrying and giving in to marriage. And others say, I have just bought a new field. I must go and see it. I've just bought some young, some new oxen, rather, strong oxen. I want to go and try them out. Right away, you can understand what God Almighty is saying when he says, remember Lord's wife. The things that stopped her from entering heaven. She was right at the door, at the gate. She had been removed from the lake of fire. And she went right back into the lake of fire. And that is what the Lord is saying. That if you look at the present day church, yes indeed it is true, God is justified. The Lord is justified to be able to caution the present day church because there are so many things in her life now that point her right back to the kingdoms of the world while the kingdom of God has been prepared here. Hallelujah! Even as an individual, person, as a believer alone, in that room alone, when you're, now you don't have a crowd, you don't have your wife, you don't have your children, you are just alone now. You should be able to interrogate yourself. Because the matters of eternity are eternal. You don't want to make an error with it. You should ask yourself, what is it that you are doing in you that you think can shock your eternity into the kingdom of glory? Hallelujah. That's where I want us to begin from, blessed people, in a very mighty way. And it says here, 
Revelation chapter 3. I'm just walking with you, jogging with you. We are now try, starting to jog, you know, little jogging now, right? You know, you walk and then you reach a point, you start jogging, right? Little jogging, just jogging, jogging, enjoying the heartbeats, the cardio, the cardiovascular, just enjoying the circulation in the brain and all that, the muscles, stretching limbs. We are now jogging. Revelation chapter 3. What are the things that the Lord is highlighting? What is the message he's highlighting when he says, remember me, says Lord. Even in this ministry of repentance, there are people that have seen the cloud. You have seen the glory of God. You have seen the creepers walking. You know that nothing has ever happened like this in the history of the church. Commanding from Brazil, blind eyes open in Kericho, cripple walk in Oyugis, and all this kind of thing. Commanding from Kenya, a senator in, uh, in Finland gets up and walks away. In Brazil, a, a hand that was shriveled is stretched. Even in this ministry, there are people that see all this and then end up where? Backsliding, say, no, I want to fall away and do my own thing. Look for another church and submit myself there as a sheep. The Lord is saying that what Lord's wife did, walking with God, being held by hands and taken out of the gate, is equivalent to what Judas Iscariot did. Walking with Jesus, very close like that, even keeping the finances, and then at the end, very far from Jesus. And lost soul. How do you walk with the cloud of God and then become a lost soul? The cloud has not come. Has not come since the Old Testament. The rains. Just take anything should be able to touch you, transform you and push you into the kingdom of God. Even just the creepers. Even just the visitation is in, in Rio de Janeiro. 14 blind people come to the meeting, 14 blind people healed. 100%. Even just that alone. Even just that alone. When you see should stun you and cause you to take your salvation more seriously, your holiness more seriously, your righteousness more seriously, about the kingdom of God more seriously, and then reshape your salvation. I'm talking about as a person. There are many people right now in this ministry, walking like this, but probably they have looked back. They have looked back. And it's more dangerous that way. Because you think you're moving as a group. No. Not at all. That's why I'm saying, you need to examine yourself as a person alone in your bedroom alone. Leave your wife alone. Leave your children alone. And ask yourself, am I walking right with the Lord? Even as a pastor, am I faithful to the Lord? Because matters of eternity are not a joke. And so, the Lord is simply saying that Judas Iscariot walked very close with Jesus. Too close. But then at the end, lost his soul in the eternal lake of fire. Why? For how much? 30 pieces of silver, my Lord. Money. Material wealth of this earth. They're looking back. Do you understand? And that's why I want us on this journey, step by step, to walk you into self-interrogation. Into self-audit. Because this thing of group, group church, we need some time to, make, to stop it a bit. People examine individual because you'll stand alone. Group, group, oh, our ministry, our prophet. Oh, no. Not at all. Not our prophet. Look, the nations are here. They also need to hear this glorious announcement. And so, there is no room. You will not appear before the Lord as a group. Not at all. There are people in this ministry now walking and they have looked back. Today is the moment of awakening. I'm talking about a personal audit. For you to enter, forget about your children or your friends or your WhatsApp group or whatever. Examine yourself. Ask yourself, am I really walking right with God? So can we start step by step 
and see what the Lord implied. The message he transmitted when he said in Luke 17, 32, remember Lord's wife. The book of Revelation chapter 3. We are reading together verses 15 and 20. What does he say? He says the following. Verse 15 he says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. Do you now understand that Lord's wife sat there, had the message from heaven directly transmitted to her by the messengers of Yahweh. The glorious messengers were too glorious when they appeared before Abraham. And Lord, to begin with, when Abraham was busy building altars for the Lord, Lord was busy in Sodoma and Gomorrah. He was busy living in Sodom and Gomorrah and battling issues there. While Abraham was busy having a conversation, a rich conversation with the Lord. Are we together? And then he says here very clearly that Lord's wife, her name is not given, is the symbolism, the representation of the lukewarm church that you see today. They are neither hot nor cold. Be very careful if you are a pastor or a bishop and you are not calling the radio. The director of Jesus Lord Radio is sitting right here now. Be very careful if you are in this ministry and you know very well that this radio is the mouthpiece of God. is the portal of God, the channel of God that God is using to speak the prophecy on Israel, prophecy on Ukraine, coronavirus, announcing the coming of the Messiah, raising cripples from there, 87 stadiums and what have you. That you know that this radio is the open portal of God talking to the nations, preparing the nations for the coming of the Messiah. Be very careful when you are that type of person that's not bothered to even attempt to call the portal of God where heaven is open. Are we now talking together? Then you have a problem. We are talking about lukewarm Christianity. At least you can say, I tried, I didn't make it, it was too busy, but I did what? I tried. You could see my desire. I wanted God to know that I have called in that portal. I long to call in that portal because that portal has changed the earth. I just wanted my voice to appear there one day as a signature. I don't know. I don't know too much. I don't know what it could do to me. Do it for me, my eternity. But I just wanted to be heard there. If that is where God's voice is speaking. Be careful with lukewarm Christianity. You can tell that Lord's wife did not believe the angels. She was lukewarm. She did not believe the angels when they said all these palatial homes, they were going to destroy them all. She could not believe the angels. You can tell that Lord's wife, because of that kind of disbelief and lukewarmness, her heart was in the world. Her heart was in the world. You can tell that. And so that's why he says, he warns here that I know your deeds, not your faith, your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I prefer a Christian, who, some, I mean somebody who is not born again, and then the gospel comes, strike their heart, they become born again, and they are on fire. I prefer that one. And they are on fire and they enter heaven. That somebody that receives the Lord becomes lukewarm and becomes drug resistant. So the gospel is not able to have enough efficacy to transform them. So they are resistant to the gospel such that it cannot deliver them. And then they enter the lake of fire. That is terrible. Be very careful if you are in this ministry and you are not trying to call the radio where the fire of God is glowing and bubujika, whatever the name is. Hallelujah. Where the flames have gone a blast. Right? That's why I say this message is to you, the individual Christian. It's not about the group anymore, the ministry of repentance anymore. 